very much for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm the Becky Scott one, and I work in the Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory. And this is my colleague Sally Fletcher, who works in the Near East Department. Yeah. Um, so I'm really pleased that Fliss showed the walkthrough of the permanent galleries from the museum, because I'm actually going to talk about something very different, because we as the people who work on earliest prehistory really have no place in the shop front at the moment. Um, I'm a Paleolithic specialist and um, Sally works on... Late Neolithic pottery. It's a hard <laughs> sound. <laughs> <laughs> really hard sound. <laughs> um, but how does... Is it... Is one? Do you see... Like, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 To get the stories that we're writing through our research, um, for which there seems to be through online engagement, through mainstream media engagement, you know, a really big appetite for. If the cats don't have no brand, then paleo certainly does, and the ice age certainly does. People think they know what these things are. But when your museum is full of all the shinies, then you're never going to get your flint or your pottery out to tell the stories you're working on. Why am I dodging the P word? So I've chosen to describe, and the museum chooses to describe what we do, not as prehistory, um, but as deep history. And that's because, you know, within what's supposed to act as a, a global museum of all of human history, Splitting prehistory off as something other, something different, sort of privileges periods within which you have the written words and, and puts us in a in a slightly darker um, place. And also we found, and especially if you work on, on the Paleolithic, prehistory and the Paleolithic past has connotations to people of naturalness um, and simplicity. And actually, this works through into this imagined hunter-gatherer past being used in a lot of ways to sort of reify current social structures. Lazy journalists will say, men do this, we do that because of our hunter-gatherer past, without actually coming to any of us to think through and talk about what that hunter-gatherer past actually is. Another reason for using deep history rather than prehistory is, although do have prehistory displays which reference earliest prehistory right at the beginning, first people. In fact, actually telling the stories of how we became human doesn't normally happen in an archaeological context. Usually it happens in museums of natural history, museums of human evolution, and interestingly in the UK, um, at show caves. So these are uh, Victorian caves where you go to marvel at stalactites. Oh, by the way, there's also ancient people. However, despite this lack of a place in the window, Paleolithic research at the end is really, really vibrant. So from at least 2003, there's been a big series of research projects coming through, attracted a lot of funding um, through a whole series of projects, produced a lot of publications, we have a big team of people working on these stories spanning two million years um, and many, many different human species and an incredible amount of artefacts. You never see them. Since 2005, however, the Paleolithic has started to creep out of the closet and into the main museum, mainly through this space. So this is room three. Um, which you will find on the right hand side as you come in through the main entrance to the British Museum and it's a small temporary exhibition space probably about a third again the length of this room about a similar width and it's a changing space um, used just for short periods so four to eight week exhibitions to really showcase individual objects or small groups of objects um, and focus in detail on those. So in 2005, the very first of these exhibitions curated by Jill Cook uh, was the exhibition Made in Africa, which concentrated just on three 
um, Paleolithic hand axes from Moldavai Gorge, they're two million years old. Actually, if you're into stones, they're fairly unremarkable. But they were lit as art historical objects. They were made to look very beautiful and, and it was the fact of their oldness and using the grammar of, um, of, of art historical display to make them attractive and beautiful. This was followed in 2010 by another exhibition within the same space which focused on this object, a single object, um, the swimming reindeer, which is a battle from Monterstruck. So that's about 13 and a half thousand years old. And it really went through all the information that could be taken from this object, which is beautiful, intricately carved, and presented it as a masterpiece of the art I say. So then again, you have this appeal to this art historical sense and way of setting things up culminating in 2013 with this fantastic exhibition, a larger exhibition in the uh, exhibition space upstairs at the museum, Ice Age Art, Arrival of the Modern Mind, which brought together many of these masterpieces from across Europe and again presented them very much as art to be enjoyed for art's sake and played them against modern works uh, by Picasso and by Henry Moore that were inspired by these. However, what we mostly deal with is this sort of stuff. So it's bones, it's tools, it's mud. This is the site of Paysborough um, in North Norfolk, which at at least 850,000 years ago is evidence of the earliest people to ever get into Northern Europe. So it has a lot to tell us about survivorship, evolution, you know, journeys up into Europe. Um, and it's exceptional evidence, but really, really unexceptional finds if you don't love flint. Even more exceptionally, but even more insubstant insubstantial, were these finds from the site. So these are the Haysborough footprints. Um, back in 2013, we were doing some survey work there. We happened to have a geoarchaeologist with us who works um, in Borth, where there are Mesolithic footprints. As this was peeled off by the sea, he said, I think we've got a footprint surface. Within a couple of days, we had um, Sarah Duffy from York come in and record it using photogrammetry. Within two weeks, it had gone. And actually, working from Sarah's model, you can pick out at least 49 individuals who are all fairly short, you know, slightly taller than me, some of them, but also children. So you capture this moment almost a million years ago where you have a little group of people moving through this estuary. They don't go in a straight line because I don't know about you and who has children here, but you cannot go in a straight <laughs> line when you're trying to shepherd your children through. Anyway, these objects are difficult to present. They're, they're not an object. If anything, they're a trace fossil. They're the absence of an object. So what actually happened was this was presented in a very different way within the same space, um, but brought in and played with in a way which addressed modern concerns about migration and leaving one's, one's country and becoming an exile, um, but also time depth to these processes. So the exhibition was pulled together between three main stops. Um, as a guide, there was a video installation which was excerpts from this film in which Edouard Pisson reflected on the, on the process of migration. This very, very moving art book um, by the Iraqi artist Al Faraji, in which he reflects on his own experience and, and the process of being an exile. And then the footprints themselves, which are presented in two ways that sort of play with their liminality and, and, and how insubstantial they are. So at one point, we 3D printed out a section of the surface. So you can touch that, put your hand into it, and actually feel toe spaces. But the other part was, which centered the exhibition um, was this sort of section of shipping container into which you could move and then be cued into the landscape by, by birdsong, by water lapping, and watch on the floor beneath you the sea come in, 
cover the, the footprints up and then ebb away just leaving these, these prints exposed. And what was really interesting um, was seeing how people responded to this. So just, just going and standing there and watching people, you'd either have older adults who were scared to go in it because it was something to be, be watched and to, to be sort of consumed versus if you ever had children in there, they just ran straight in and we're trying to put their feet in the footprint. So it was really interesting to see the differences in how people responded to that. And I'll move on to Sally. You just remember that I'm here. <laughs> she just looked, she just did that thing where she went, oh my goodness, you're here. You've been so working. It's not working. It's not working. I am busy. Shall I be your glamorous assistant? Yeah, you might need to be. It really isn't. There you go. Yeah, yes. the down arrow is the one that points that way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, moving on. Okay. So, same space, still in room three at the museum. Um, and this is a show about the Jericho skull, which um, is, again, a fascinating object. People get very excited about the Jericho skull. It's part of a group of seven that was found at the site of Jericho in 1953 by the King of Kenyon. And um, it is a human uh, cranium which has a clustered face added to the bottom of it here and it has inserted beautiful uh, shell eyes and it's super old not as old as the stuff that becky's been talking about but still in the dim mists of time it's about nine and a half thousand years old and with this show um, we wanted to look at ways that we could get people to engage with an object that is quite so old that is to some people quite repelling people don't like the idea that this is in fact a dead person that you are literally staring in the face and we wanted to try and engage visitors with some of those big stories that are out there particularly associated with this period of archaeology in the Middle East so the first um, big cities are beginning to just have their very 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 earliest origins and um, we have huge questions about revering the dead there's lots of terms that are bandied around around ancestor cult there's a lot going on and we wanted to see if we could tell some of those big stories in this exhibition. So I'm going to take you through it in a series of steps. Step one, thank you Becky, step one was being to try and get people to really, really engage with the plastic skull itself. And that was partly by throwing away entirely any idea of timelines. So when Chris is saying people really want timelines, I was thinking, oh no, I got rid of the timeline. Um, but I got rid of the timeline because of those queries around we don't really know. If you read the original reports from Jericho, they used this newfangled science known as radiocarbon dating, and they came up with the date for the, the uh, objects from this period of around 5000, 5000 BC. We now know that's way, way wrong. It's way too young. These things are much, much older. There's lots of fantastic research being done around the origins of plant domestication and animal domestication and the dates are swinging backwards and forwards and the public just doesn't care. <laughs> they just don't care. They don't want to know about my internal angst about the dating of the pre-pottery Neolithic period. They do not care. Um, and when I said this to our interpretation officer, I said, they don't care. She looked at me with this deep, horrified sort of, how could I not care that the public don't care? But I kind of felt I needed to go with that. So I just stuck to the Jericho skull is about nine and a half thousand years old and left it there to give people a sense that it's really, really old and then just leave that where it, where it fell sort of thing. Um, the really important thing we put on the very, very first panel in the exhibition is we would like you to meet this person because all the way through we wanted to remind people that this is not some alien being, this is not some sort of hairy thing living in a cave, it's none of those preconceptions you might have about period from people from this time period. This is a modern human living actually a very modern life um, and we'll come to um, another way that we we'll try to bring that out in a second. The other thing that I really wanted people to do was look very closely right the way around the object. So a lot of the labels encourage people to engage and re-engage. It was really gratifying watching people interact in the exhibition because they looked at the object, they read the label, and then that magical thing that all curators want to see, they looked back up. Um, and that was great. So for example here, the label talks about faint finger marks still visible in the mud that was inserted into the back of the skull to hold the whole thing together. You can still see those finger marks 
from nine and a half thousand years ago. Let's have the next slide. Fantastic. So on to some of those big stories, those big questions, those early big settlements. We wanted to bring that through. We brought that through by talking about the site. Um, we went with this image, big image on the wall to try and get across that idea that Jericho is the oldest city in the world known with continuous occupation right the way through from about nine and a half thousand years ago, even slightly earlier than that, right the way through to the present day. And we could have written a huge, great big long piece of text all about that, detailing all the different time periods that the city's been through. And in the end, we just went with photograph, which does what it says on the tin. This is the sign to the site. We went with that and tried to keep it really clean and simple. We wanted to engage families, so we brought in the character of Kathleen Kenyon. We did a graphic based on this picture of her, and we had her talking on these extra banners that went through the exhibition with really, really condensed text. The idea being that if you walk in with your family and you have your picked moment, the parents don't, don't need to translate, they can just go straight to the orange banners. These had a mixed reception. Some people said, why is there a nurse taking this out <laughs> We didn't get it entirely right. Some people went, that's rubbish. Why would we just not read the full label? Which, you know, with that, again, a curator's dream, someone that wants to read the full label. But generally, there was quite a lot of positive responses. And we found that a lot of adults read this text first, kind of, they have a child with them or not, and then maybe engage more deeply with the more detailed text above. Interesting little point, Kathleen Kenyon was the daughter of one of the directors of the British Museum, so we made the point in a weird kind of way she was sort of coming home. Next. Um, so we also wanted to bring in the that I've been working on for quite some time, there was about eight years of research left in this, and we did some CT scans <coughs> work with the skull to get past the layers of plaster, which means you can't see what's going on underneath, look at the cranial underneath, have it 3D printed, we put the 3D prints into the gallery so people could see. No, no, you were right, go on. Uh, put the 3D prints into the gallery so people could see what we were basing our research on. They could actually see the skull underneath. And then moving on, we had a facial reconstruction done old school style by the, the original uh, uh, Rich Neve, who did this right from the start. And last slide had people engage with the person themselves. I was thrilled when we got this picture, because our point was, this man could walk down any street in London and you would not be surprised at his appearance. Here he is, <laughs> <laughs> looking at himself. But we really wanted to make that point, because one of the things that we brought out was that this person had undergone cranial modification. They'd had their skull shape artificially altered in infancy, but it actually had very little effect on how they really looked in daily life. And the point was that their special burial, this plaster face that was put upon them, was based on life experiences that his community knew that he would have been through. Um, so we're bringing in lots of huge themes and questions right the way through the exhibition in the simplest, cleanest way you could possibly think of. So looking to the future, we decided, I think from both of our, our shows, we sat there and went, what have we learned? And we've learned that we can move on from treating prehistoric objects as art. We've done that quite a few times now. We've found that people respond positively to it. It's time to move on. Um, so we can move on from their aesthetic qualities. Um, and we need to talk about how essential interdisciplinary research is to understanding deep history. So my work and Becky's work pulled in an awful lot of team projects. I think I listed the number of people that was involved in getting the show together when I did my talk with staff in the museum. They were amazed at how many people had been involved. Um, and it's, we think that some of the details that give you those connections between modern audiences and past peoples are really key to engaging visitors. So it's the fact that the children were walking along the foreshore. The fact that you can look somebody in the face is what really gets people excited and involved. Thank you. Thank you too much.